Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Chapter 9 the killing begins. After his party, I don't hear from Ude for days. Maybe he's nursing a hangover. There's no training, no missions, nothing. I'm just kept waiting. I don't even know if Ude's still in Iraq. Maybe he's flown to a health spa in Europe to detox. Even Munyam Hamd only phones occasionally and for no real purpose. To pass the time, I play poker with secret service officers for small stakes. I must be lucky because I keep winning. As we play, we chat and I learn a lot about Saddam Hussein's security organization. He's divided his guards into three units. Each is allocated its own specific tasks and missions. The first troop always monitors the second and the second monitors the third. The theory behind this thinking is all the officers are checked and watched by other officers making it virtually impossible for a potential assassin to penetrate the organization as no one trusts anyone else and the slightest concern must be reported immediately. The first tier only consists of officers that Saddam Hussein has known for years. He has either observed them himself or had them watched by others. They are considered completely loyal and trustworthy. They have to be as Saddam's life depends on them. They escort Saddam wherever he goes. They are always near to him. They even stand outside the door when he goes to the toilet. All of them either belong to the Tikriti family clan or come from the area around Tikrit. This group numbers between 1,000 and 1,200 officers. Their training is the very best. They're all martial arts experts. They're also well armed at all times. Lower ranking officers carry a high caliber revolver a machine gun with two spare ammo magazines and have three or four hand grenades clipped to their belts. They have immediate access to all the information services and have the very latest walkie-talkie radios with its own frequencies and wear bulletproof vests under their uniforms. Not conventional thick, heavy ones but light, thin ones made of carbon fibers that give far greater protection. During normal duties, the highest ranks only carry a revolver or pistol. They are considered privileged and have a job for life as long as they keep Saddam alive and in power. And as long as they remain loyal and devoted to him. But why wouldn't they? Most had nothing before. Now they earn vast sums of money and get a new car every six months. If they don't want a car, they're rewarded with either a financial bonus or land and luxury houses. A special administration department's sole responsibility is to award gifts and bonuses to these officers and their families. Anyone with ambitions to be promoted to this first, prestigious group must have an exemplary service record. The commander of the first, elite corps is the president himself. The second brigade has a similar structure to the first. Most of the men in this one are also from Tikrit. The lower ranks are armed with machine guns and grenades, the officers just carry handguns. They're on call around the clock. If men from the first troop are killed or injured, they're automatically replaced by the best from the second contingent. There's no other way of promotion to the first group. Only when there's a vacancy can a member of the second unit rise to a higher status protection force. It's a tough system but it works well as it means the men in the second tier are waiting like vultures to get their big chance. They spy, observe and record. Infringements of discipline and loyalty lead to men from the first group being expelled and a place being created. It's a cunning, self-regulating measure. Almost everyone keeps records on the activities of his colleagues. Every instance of excessive drinking, a visit to a brothel is noted and used to outmaneuver one's rival. Saddam enforces this system of conniving and denouncement as much as he can and he's a past and present master of such scheming. 
he's always trying to play his own people off against each other. Sometimes he even heaps his enemies with praise to really stir things up. The better known his victim the greater the respect he apparently shows them. The fact that there's method in his madness is shown by one case in particular, that of General Salah al-Qadi. In 1982, in Basra, the general had ordered his troops to retreat. Saddam knew perfectly well that the military position was untenable but he still had General Salah al-Qadi discreetly killed the very next day. But Saddam then honored the murdered general with the tribute of a martyr. The general's family, to whom Saddam personally expressed his condolences, received all the presidential favors that go with such a title, a car, a plot of land and a long-term, interest-free bank loan. Once, one of my poker-playing Secret Service officers confided in me, the president had 21 senior Ba'ath party officials and 180 officers executed. They were all allegedly guilty of conspiracy. A cameraman, Shakir Yassin, filmed the bloodbath and his film is used in the psychological training on Saddam's protection force. The film begins showing hundreds of Ba'ath officials sitting in the party leadership's huge called a hall, Hall of Eternity. They've all been summoned there by their leader. Saddam Hussein strides into the hall. He looks as composed and elegant as ever with a fat cigar in his right hand. Saddam orders the secretary of the command to come to the microphone. This is Abdul Hussein Makati. He looks in a terrible state, as if he's just been tortured. Saddam yells at him, speak. Reveal the deed of shame. Abdul Hussein Makati begins uttering a list of names. Saddam bellows, out. Go. And bodyguards are seen leading away the party officials whose names have been called out. The next scene shows the men being brought out into the gardens of the president's palace where they are lined up blindfolded against a wall. Farzan al-Tikriti, Saddam's brother and soon-to-be UN ambassador in Geneva, is in charge of the executions. He's had a brilliant idea which is why the victims are bizarrely forced to put on red football shirts. Farzan al-Tikriti insists the condemned men wear red which is an ancient Ottoman Empire tradition. He's also had another idea which is almost beyond belief. The condemned men are not to be shot by Saddam's bodyguards but by the bodyguards' own family members. To show them how much power they have? To bind them to the party? To toughen them up? The question defies an answer from a sane mind. The film shows two children standing next to Barzan al-Tikriti. They are his eight-year-old son, Muhammad, and Uday who was just 15 and my classmate at the time. Muhammad is handed a pistol by his father and told, take this and choose the one you want to kill. The boy does what he's told and fires at a pleading, blindfolded man with his arms defensively outstretched. My fellow poker players describe all these scenes to me in gruesome detail. I feel as if they want to warn me, don't mess with the clan. They'll make short work of you. All members of the presidential corps are killers who love their job. By far the biggest of the three presidential brigades is the third, the Republican Guard. They're recruited more widely but mainly from Tikrit, Baghdad, and Ninyana. They only take raw recruits recommended by the Secret Service or the Ba'ath Party. All applicants must be from families of proven loyalty to the regime. If any member of it has been even suspected of the slightest indiscretion then the application is null and void. Many are accepted. The Republican Guard consists of over 10 battalions. Each unit is trained in the use of all conceivable weaponry. They present the public face of Saddam's regime. The main task of the Republican Guards is to make sure any place Saddam visits is completely safe. Two days in advance of any presidential appearance, the commander of the 1st Protection Squad is informed of three possible destinations. He passes on this information to the head of the Republican Guard. Surveillance squads are immediately sent to all three locations. Whole districts are cordoned off and searched. A member of the Republican Guard is posted on every street corner. Saddam only decides on his final destination at the very last minute. The presidential entourage travels in 10 identical limousines. The limousine Saddam drives is also decided by him. Ambulance is equipped with mobile operating theaters and blood supplies matching Saddam's, probably taken from the president or at least from a near relative, discreetly follow the convoy. If he's visiting his troops at the front, 
Saddam chooses between one of his helicopters or a Boeing jet. In order to test his pilots, Saddam thinks up more and more tricks. For example, he once ordered all his escorts to arrive dressed in winter clothes. Naturally, they all obeyed their president's orders and turned up in thick winter apparel. But Saddam arrived in lightweight summer clothing. Why? He was asked, aren't we going to Moscow? Saddam replied with a grin, no, we're flying south. That sums up Iraq's wily president for you. His bluffs fooled everyone including Western intelligence services and leaders in later years. In his increasingly rare visits to the front, Republican guards make sure all ammunition is removed from soldiers' weapons before the president arrives. The Republican guards can pull rank over normal Iraqi army soldiers. Their pay reflects this superiority, it's six times higher. And at very opportunity, such as the president's birthday, they receive huge bonuses. The Republican Guard have their own barracks but they're aware their accommodation and facilities is not as good as the first two corps. The chosen elites is in the palace grounds with an exclusive gymnasium, and shooting club where I was trained. They also have a canteen serving better food and a leisure area with billiard tables, ping pong tables, bowling alleys and even a cinema. All these first class facilities and equipment is also available to me providing I make my presence known to Uday's bodyguards and my custodians. All this somehow makes my isolation easier to bear. It also means I'm able to pick up snippets of inside information about Saddam's regime. I hear that, after Uday's birthday party, he flew to Geneva to see his uncle, Barzan al Tikriti, and only returned yesterday to make a sensational announcement. Apparently, at the UN, Barzan al Tikriti has taken ceasefire negotiations with Iran to a new stage. Iraqi television is still glorifying the deeds of brave frontline Iraqi troops. But the truth is, we all know Saddam has been frustrated in his objective to win. The war, despite playing the ace up his sleeve of poison gas. It's true that, at the start of the war, Iraqi forces took the initiative and advanced into Iran but they couldn't hold their gains and now our leaders are content to keep Iranian troops outside long-established Iraqi territory. I wonder if these negotiations mean the pointless war which is no more than a personal vendetta between Saddam Hussein and Ayatollah Khomeini over their religious differences, is finally over? It isn't, it's just stopped for both sides to draw breath and reflect. On the 18th of July 1988, I'm called to project number 7 at an alarmingly early hour of the morning. Something's up. I hurriedly get up. My chauffeur drives me to Uday at top speed. Bekar al Nasiri, who holds the impressive title of house administrator, is waiting impatiently for me. He's excited, everyone at Project No. 7 seems to be, even the servants. I'm rushed to Uday's study. Uday seems the most excited of them all. On seeing my quizzical expression, he shouts, We've won the war. They've signed. I'm later so see on the news an official explanation of Uday's delight. It appears that after long and tough negotiations, Barzan al Tikriti agreed to UN Resolution 598 and signed a ceasefire treaty with Iran. At the stroke of a pen, he ended the longest conventional war fought by two sovereign states in the 20th century. Uday seems almost beside himself with joy. Although I wonder whether it's relief. He puts on an Abdelakal tape and the song praising his father blasts out at maximum volume. Uday throws his arms around everyone present, hugs and even kisses us. Uday declares himself, his father and all Iraqis to have won an historic victory and we all agree with him. Iraq has wiped the floor with the fundamentalists in Tehran. In reality, the war has ended with a pact between two exhausted, depleted, demoralized states. Iraqi forces are virtually in the same positions they started from in September 1980. Saddam started the war because he wanted to take control of the Shad al-Arab region and also to prove he was the greatest Arab leader ever. Back in 1979, Saddam had witnessed the fall of his neighbor the Iranian Shah and the ascendancy to power of his deadly enemy Ayatollah Khomeini. Saddam saw these events as an opportunity to settle old scores and a chance for Iraq to dominate the Gulf and to achieve immortality for the illegitimate child from Tikrit. Amongst the wild celebrations going on that day in Project No. 7, my doubts are irrelevant. 
and I'm careful not to tarnish our victory. Uday orders a waiter to bring us champagne. Chilled, sparkling, vintage champagne. Ironically, the bottle pops its cork like a field gun firing a shell. We all clink glasses, hug, clink glasses again. Large numbers of Uday's friends hear the news and hastily arrive to offer their congratulations. Among them is Dr. Mahmoud Samari. He's responsible for all Uday's PR and immediately begins organizing television broadcasts and newspaper interviews so Uday can bask in the glorious victory. Soon after, Dr. Samari and Uday leave us to do these interviews. The next few days and weeks are filled with drinking and parties. The whole of Baghdad celebrates. Millions of people are on the streets, no Baghdadi can bear to sit at home. It's reminiscent of when Saddam Hussein came to power. Strangers kiss and hug each other. There's dancing in the streets. The climax of the celebrations comes on the 8th of August. The end of the war officially comes into effect at midnight. All factories have ground to a standstill. Shops and offices officially must close. It's a completely pointless decree as no one is working at that time anyway. Saddam's painters and propaganda professionals have used the last few days to update the president's image in line with recent events. Armies of painters are busy creating new images of our great, victorious military commander which are then distributed all around Iraq. In the early years of the war with Iran, Saddam had depicted himself as a courageous military leader. He had hundreds of military uniforms tailored for him and was always seen wearing one. Everywhere every Iraqi looked, we saw images of him as a fighter in a trench, a pilot or a battling Saladin. It all ensured the myth of Saddam as a successful military leader was spread all over the country. He became the personification of Iraq's war on Iran. But as Iraqi casualties increased and our troops failed to hold the Iranian bases they'd seized in the early months of the war, the warlike images of Saddam were suddenly replaced with more statesmanlike images. Saddam in a suit, Saddam with children, Saddam as a Muslim in the headscarf worn by southern Arabs even Saddam in Kurdish national costume. Now the war's over and a great victory claimed, the strategy has changed once more and Saddam is again presented as a military hero. In the past few days, posters have been pasted up all over Iraq showing him as a brave fighter and beaming victor. Similar images are in all the newspapers. In some editions, there's an image of Saddam on almost every page. It's exactly the same on Iraqi television. Clips of Saddam are on all the time and all with a military connection. His personality cult is unlimited now. You almost get the feeling that he's been taken in by his own propaganda. On the 8th of August, Uday orders me to fly to the southern city of Basra. I'm to visit the 3rd and 7th units to congratulate the brave soldiers on their glorious victory. We go by helicopter exactly as we did on my previous visit. But this time I don't have a costume change just the black military uniform with the embroidered monogram of Uday Saddam Hussein. Some of the bodyguards had already set off to Basra the previous day. They were part of a convoy of trucks laden with toys and presents for the civilian population of Basra. As my helicopter lands on the parade ground, soldiers representing the 3rd and 7th units are lined up to welcome me. After being greeted by the commanders, we walk up and down the lines, inspecting the troops. I don't deliver a speech to them all, just pass on the president's and my own congratulations to the officers and hand out decrees passed to me by Munyam Hamd. My official visit to the soldiers is followed by an unofficial duty. I leave the barrack grounds to do a public appearance for the population of Basra. The ordinary people who are going to see me have been rounded up by my bodyguards the day before, I estimate there must be three to four thousand of them. I note there are hardly any men in the crowd just children, women and old people. They enthusiastically shout, Long live Saddam Hussein! Long live Saddam Hussein! Even the women sing and chant their president's praises. Although apparently friendly, I find it quite intimidating. I'm surrounded by bodyguards and we march towards children who are stood in the front row waving Iraqi flags. The trucks loaded with gifts drive up. A bodyguard hands me three presents which I give to the eager, dirty hands of the children. They look incredibly excited. As I act like Father Christmas, I ask them how they are. 
I'm aware soldiers from the barracks are throwing more gifts from the trucks into the crowd all around me. It's a chaotic but happy atmosphere. Suddenly, a shot rings out. I've no idea where it came from or who fired it but I know it was aimed at me. As the crowd scream and scatter, my bodyguards rush towards me, form a living protective shield of human bodies, hurry me over to a car and bundle me into it. We dash back to the helicopter and fly back to Baghdad as fast as the helicopter will go. During the flight, I begin to learn what happened. It was an attempt on my life. The news causes me to take several deep breaths. I realize I'm drenched in sweat as it suddenly dawns on me the danger I was in. That bullet could have easily killed me. I lean back in my seat, stare at the back of the pilot in front of me and try to let myself be distracted by the loud clatter of the rotor blades. Another radio communication comes through. The co-pilot writes it down and then shouts it out to me, they hit Abdullah al-Dalimi. He's got a serious wound in his chest. Abdullah al-Dalimi is one of Uday's youngest bodyguards, only 18 or 20 years old at most. He was standing right next to me when the shot was fired and caught the bullet meant for me. Will he make it? I shouted back. I see the co-pilot shrug his shoulders, I don't know, he shouts in reply. Shortly afterwards, a third message comes through informing us the gunman was overpowered and has been arrested. He's a young Iraqi army deserter, 23 years old. His two brothers had been killed in the war. Safely back in my apartment, I write a detailed report of the attack and present it to Uday. To my surprise, he isn't interested in reading it so I pass it on to Munyam Hamd but even his reaction is icy cold. Apparently, it's already been ordered that the gunman be shot. There's no interrogation of the prisoner and no trial. The execution is carried out the next day. That's the end of the matter and Munyam Hamd advises me never to mention it again. I agree. To Uday, the whole unpleasant business in Basra is of no interest whatsoever. It's as though it never happened. He's preoccupied with the celebrations in Baghdad and the planned triumphant processions in homage to the great victor Saddam Hussein. Despite the recent assassination attempt, Uday is determined to be present at all these celebrations and enjoy them to the full. And what Uday wants Uday gets. We drive in a convoy to the district of Al-Mansur. There are thousands of people out on Palestinian street. Although it's a huge, noisy crowd the mood seems relaxed. In fact, everyone in Baghdad seems happy and relieved the war's finally over. Uday is sitting in an armor-plated Mercedes with a sunroof. For once, he's being driven by a chauffeur. Uday has a Kalashnikov in his left hand and his revolver in his right hand. As Uday's car turns into the crowded street and begins to crawl slowly along it through the hordes of joyful civilians, Uday stands up in the Mercedes, pops his torso out the sunroof, points both his guns up at the sky and opens fire with a delighted grin on his face. All the bodyguards sat in the car with Uday. And in other cars in his convoy, hold their Kalashnikovs through opened windows and fire until their magazines are empty. From a security perspective, Uday's actions were sheer madness. There were thousands of people in the street and most of the men were armed. When he popped up out the Mercedes roof, Uday presented any dissident with an unbelievably tempting target. Everyone began firing their guns into the air and Uday's volleys were virtually drowned out. In Europe or the USA, People let off fireworks to celebrate certain events but Arabs prefer to use our guns. It's quite acceptable behavior for us to fire salvos of joy up at the sky. Even I get carried up in the moment. I lean out my car and fire my gun until I have to reload. We cruise through Baghdad for three or four hours firing from our cars and cheering wildly until we're hoarse and have run out of ammunition. Even the president himself is unable to resist driving through the capital in a convoy that night and joining in the wild orgy of shooting. The victory celebrations continue for several days. Motorcades inch their way through the city with drivers and passengers firing guns with reckless abandon into the air. They often get totally out of control and Iraqi television carries regular announcements calling for greater thought and care. Several people are injured and a few even killed. But no one heeds the warning. Shooting is like a drug to Iraqis, an expression of their boundless delight in victory. Anyway, why should the Iraqi people? 
behave any different from the leaders they are constantly being forced to look up to? Ude must fire over 10,000 rounds during his triumphant victory tours of the city. Sometimes Ude's convoy passes the street where my parents live. I see the front door of my family home, my father's white Volvo and my brother's cars parked outside. I'm only a few yards from the people I love most in the world but haven't seen since September last year. I hope and pray I might get a glimpse of one of my brothers, sisters, mother or father. They might either be leaving the house or coming home. Then at least I would see them although making contact with them would be impossible as it was strictly forbidden for any car to leave the convoy end. Any bodyguard to get out. Uday had forbidden us to even stop. All I could do would be to wave frantically and hope they spot me. But I don't see anyone. Every time we drive along the street it's completely empty. The feeling of wanting to see my family is so strong I decide to talk to Uday about it. I know he'll never be in a better mood. I rather apprehensively raise the issue with Uday late in the afternoon on the 14th August. As usual, his reaction is not what I expected it to be. Latif, he says, you've been with me for 11 months now, you've carried out my orders 100%. You are a good man. He goes on to reveal that I've been under surveillance for every hour of those 11 months. You haven't made a single mistake, so. Uday's face assumes a rare compassionate expression, you can see your parents. When? Tonight, if you want to, he replies. But talk to Munyam Hamd first. As methodical as usual, Munyam Hamd gives me strict instructions about my visit. Don't say a word about your work not a whisper about Uday. No hints. No hidden references. For their sake as well as yours. Is that clear Latif? I nod. My visit is scheduled for 11 p.m. that evening. I'm not allowed to ring my parents beforehand. Secret service agents tell me that my parents, my sisters Galala and Juan and my brothers Yodi, Roby and Omid are all at home. I now know my parents' house is under surveillance as well. At exactly 11 p.m., we drive up to the front of my home in al -Adamiya. I ring the doorbell. Wait what seems like an eternity and then my mother opens the door. The light from the lamp in the doorway is so dim that at first she doesn't recognize me. Perhaps also because she wasn't expecting me and I'm wearing a dark jalaba an item of clothing that I'd never have worn when I lived at home as I. Preferred Western clothes. It's me, your Latif. I say. I throw my arms round her and hug her tightly. I feel her tense. She takes my head in her hands, almost pulling my hair. She tries to say something but her voice breaks with emotion. She begins to cry, kisses me and I feel her tears. I also have trouble controlling my feelings and bustle her into the house. When they hear my mother's sobs, my father, Brothers and sisters all rush into the hallway. My joy and relief of having my family around me again is an indescribable feeling. We hug for ages. I kiss my father, Juan, Galaha, Yodi, Roby, and Omid. No words are said for minutes. We just hug, kiss and stare at each other. Then, for the first time in many months, tears well up in my eyes and I weep. It's a full 20 minutes before we've all calmed down sufficiently to go and sit in the drawing room. My mother begins to hurl accusations at me. She lets me know in no uncertain terms how she spent weeks desperately making phone calls trying to find out whether I'd been killed in action or taken. Prisoner by the Iranians. She elaborates, the authorities didn't give us any information. All they said was you had been picked up and taken away a year ago. Latif, my son. We have all prayed for your soul because we couldn't believe you were still alive. Once again my mother dissolves into tears. My sisters put their arms round her and try to comfort her but she's beyond that. The anguish of my disappearance and shock of my reappearance back from the dead is too much for her. My father has been quietly studying me and speaks for the first time. What have they done to you, son? He's noticed my new teeth. I shake my head and answer, don't ask me. I cannot tell you. I can only say I'm well and have an interesting job to do. What jobs that Latif? Inquires my little brother Roby, 
Are you a spy? It makes me laugh. We all laugh. I repeat what I've been ordered to say, I can't tell you so stop asking questions. And don't talk to anyone about it. Just tell my friends I'm alive and well. I'm only permitted to stay with my family for a precious two hours. At 1 a.m. I have to leave. That was the arrangement. My family watch from the door as bodyguards shepherd me into a Mercedes and drive me away into the night. I feel good. Liberated. With a contented smile on my face. I relive my family reunion. I remember every detail, every word, every tear, every smile, every laugh of my sisters, every wry grin of my father even every. Blurted remark from the inquisitive Roby. It was a lovely evening. I never lost control. I never said a word I shouldn't have. I didn't drop any hints. None of them knows what I do. Maybe my father suspects because he hinted at my overbite but he never mentioned Nude's name. He knows the rules. Four days later, I'm accompanying Nude to Al Hapania. It's about 50 miles west of Baghdad and a favorite destination of the Iraqi smart set. It's a tourist spot, a beautiful place for days out, a love nest for honeymooners. There are numerous hotels tucked away in remote spots and a large lake offering all kinds of water activities. It's one of the few places in Iraq where Uday doesn't own a property which is surprising as he knows the area like the back of his hand. His father is a keen hunter and used to bring Uday here to hunt deer. Saddam taught his young son how to stalk, shoot and even how to slice open and gut a dead deer. Some days, Uday tells me as we drive to al Hapania, we would shoot up to 20 deer. My father loves killing. During our short holiday, we didn't take part in the mass extermination of herds of deer but Uday still went completely out of control. He spent the days and nights doing nothing but enjoying himself beyond belief. As is his usual habit, he slept until noon to recover from the previous night's alcoholic excesses. After that, breakfast is served followed by a conversation with Yasim. They have their usual debate about what clothes Uday should wear and which one. Out of his hundred or so Roxics, Breitling, Patek Philippe or Cartier watches, will adorn his wrist that day. The most expensive and prized item in his collection is an IWC grand complication made by Schaffhausen in Switzerland. This work of art is crafted in platinum and consists of a complicated system of 659 individual parts connected to nine hands. It's an absolute classic and worth more than a Ferrari Testarossa. For some reason known only to himself, Uday would wear it for his appearances at the Olympic Club, a tall building situated near the People's Stadium. One fact is certain. When Uday was there he didn't organize sporting events. Under his leadership the club quickly degenerated into a combination of an office, bar and amusement arcade. Uday's pimp friends go in and out far more than sportsmen or athletes and all the secretaries who work there look like bar girls which is exactly what most of them are. Uday usually stayed at the club until 1 p.m. when he would go home and have spicy meat for lunch. That's when he'd start the day's drinking. Brandy, whiskey, beer. His throat lubricated, he'd make phone calls directing various girlfriends to various properties he owned. Maybe his luxury villa right conveniently. Next door to the Olympic Club, his house in Habany or one of his many palaces in Mansour or al Azmieh. Sometimes he would have girls and women taken like livestock to his farm in al Rashtia. The evening's entertainment would take place in one of the Baghdad clubs or in one of the bars of the hotels. After the war, it was as if Uday was trying to drink and fuck himself into an early grave. And it was the same in al Hapania. Uday's entourage occupies several suites in the honeymoon hotel of al Medina. This peaceful place boasts an impressive swimming pool and well-tended gardens full of colorful flowers and lush plants. Uday's bodyguards have brought some of their leader's toys so he'll have something to play with on his holiday. These playthings include a black Honda 750cc motorbike with a gleaming chrome chassis and engine. Several BMW motorbikes, Uday wasn't a fan of. BMW cars but love their 1000cc superbike. Also along for the ride, were two Harley Davidsons and an over-the-top chopper with handlebars that would put any stag's antlers to shame. 
Ude always wanted to go hunting. But his kind of hunting was to roar through the beautiful countryside on one of his motorbikes. If he encountered some unfortunate person out walking hoping to enjoy the fresh air and peace and quiet, he'd draw his gun and shoot at their feet. Ude loved to see them flee in sheer terror so he could charge after them firing at them from behind. His fishing trips were just as unorthodox. Ude owned several jet ski water bikes which were a real novelty back then. They were manufactured by Yamaha and Kawasaki and made a terrible racket as they zipped across the lake. We'd spend hours cutting through the calm water on these scooters. One day, Ude signaled us to stop in the middle. We all gathered around him and switched off our engines as he instructed. Ude orders us to be quiet and stares down into the water looking for fish. Of course, he didn't see any as the noise from our engines and scared them away. Ude seemed to take the fact that shoals of them didn't swim up too. Welcome this public appearance by the president's son as a personal insult. He suddenly fired his gun into the water shouting, I'm going to get you. Believe me, I'm going to get you, you little beasts. Even more furious that he hasn't managed to hit a single fish, he takes his temper out on us. He orders us all to jump into the lake and swim back to the shore. None of us dare to defy him so and we jump. We're still wearing our bodyguards uniform so swimming is a real effort. When we eventually reach the shore, we're all cold, exhausted and fit to drop. I've got to educate you, is Ude's only explanation. The water scooters were collected later. We're forced to join him in these ludicrous leisure activities for several days. We go duck hunting. Fortunately, this doesn't have any bizarre twists except that we, Ude's shooting companions aren't allowed to return to the hotel until we've all downed at least one bird. Saddam likes duck hunting as well. He's an excellent shot and trains at his private shooting club. One of my fellow shooters remembers an incident. Apparently, Saddam was out duck shooting with one of his political advisors. A duck was spotted and Saddam offered his companion the chance to have first shot but the man declined. What? Saddam shouted, you've been a Bathist for 20 years and can't kill. The ducks we shoot are fed to Uday's fighting dogs. As we arrive back at our hotel, we encounter a young couple romantically strolling hand in hand in the hotel gardens. They are obviously newlyweds on honeymoon. Uday likes the look of the young woman. He stops and calls out something to the couple. I don't hear what he says but, knowing Uday, it's probably some crude remark. The couple either don't hear it or ignore it and just continue strolling. Uday takes this as a deliberate insult to the president's son. He dismounts his motorbike and orders his bodyguards to follow him. Inwardly, I grimace. I know what's going to happen next. For Uday's honor to be restored, he will take the woman's honor. It won't matter to him whether she's pretty or ugly. He will break her. He hates anyone standing up to him. The couple notice us approaching and quicken their pace. Uday starts running. His escort starts running too. Uday catches up with the couple and grabs the woman by her arm. You are too good for a man like him, he smirks. The woman's husband is smartly dressed in an Iraqi army uniform with the rank of a captain. Come on forget about him. You can have me. Come to my suite. Until those words, the officer stands next to his wife as if undecided what he should do and afraid to do anything. But now he yells at Ude and is about to attack him when the bodyguards haul him back. In front of his frightened wife, he's beaten up. He tries his best to fight them off and protect his wife but stands no chance against the six bodyguards. The couple are dragged back to the foyer of the Al Medina Hotel. The man shouts and rages but every time he tries to pull himself free, he's punched in the face, the stomach and his kidneys. They aren't at all worried that the vicious beating is taking place in front of the hotel staff and other guests. Everyone witnesses what's happening but can do nothing, myself included. We all feel sorry for the man but it would be asking for the same treatment to help him. I feel ashamed of myself and my fellow Iraqis. Uday has the young woman taken to his suite as if she's a call girl. In his lounge, he tries to calm her down as she's in a highly frightened state and just keeps repeating that she only got married the day before. Uday offers her a glass of whiskey. 
She shakes her head so he suggests champagne. She shakes her head again, fights back tears and cowers on the couch. Uday's reassuring voice suddenly changes into a hysterical shriek. It's just as ear-piercing and sinister as his hee-hee-hee staccato laugh. He orders the woman to undress. She pleads with him, no, please sir, no, but the more she begs the more furious Uday gets. In front of all of us, he pulls his belt from the top of his trousers. Rolls the buckle around his right hand like a knuckle duster and punches the woman full in her face with it. Her face cut, the woman screams in pain then stumbles to her feet and tries to run away. But Udi darts after her, loops his belt around her neck and pulls it until she chokes. He loosens it and she collapses on the floor. Trying to get her breath back, she begs him to leave her alone, to show mercy and not to dishonor her. But Uday switched to his psychotic mood I'd witnessed before during my training. He whips her with his belt until her body bleeds. Uday pants, intoxicated by his own violent blood pumping through his body. The blood, the swish of the lashes, the pain that his victim is experiencing excites him even more, seemingly driving him out of his mind. He tries to kiss her and put his tongue inside her mouth. She squirms away trying to push him back but her strength is giving out and is no match for his. Her sobbing changes to a low desperate moan of despair. He wrenches her thighs apart. She twists herself free of his grip. Uday retaliates by striking her in the face with the back of his hand. Blood trickles out of her nose. It's like a white flag of surrender. She's been whipped and beaten into submission. Uday enters her and we don't hear any more screams just his panting moans. It's the most degrading scene I've ever witnessed. After Ude has satisfied himself, he comes out the bedroom with a huge, smug grin on his face. He pours himself a large brandy and begins chatting about the duck shoot as if nothing notable had happened since. Suddenly, we hear a long shrill scream that seems to go on forever before it's abruptly silenced. I rush into the bedroom and see the balcony door is wide open. I dash out onto the balcony and look down. The woman is lying motionless on the concrete walkway in front of the hotel entrance. She's half naked and covered with blood. Uday comes out onto the balcony. I stare at him but he avoids my look and asks almost casually, is she dead? Of course she's dead. She jumped off the hotel balcony because she couldn't stand the shame of having to tell her husband of just one day, what had happened to her. With some of the other bodyguards, I run down to the foyer. The hotel staff already know about the woman's death. They heard her scream too. They stare at us with terror in their eyes. They don't say a word but their expressions are accusing and tell me how much they despise us. Uday, the bodyguards, me. They can't quite work out who I am. Uday's brother maybe? The victim's husband yells, you murderers you beasts. Still in his suite, Uday hears the man's shouts. He orders the husband is taken to Baghdad and locked in the Qasr al-Nayaja, the infamous prison of no return. A military court later finds the officer, whose name is Saad Abd al-Rask, guilty of insulting the president. According to paragraph 225 of the Iraqi constitution, that crime carries the death penalty. Captain Saad Abd al-Rask who had spent 10 years of his short life serving the Iraqi army, is given the death sentence, but is saved from the firing squad. By the fact that he has been decorated with three medals for his outstanding courage. One of these medals is called the Medal of Honor and it saves his life, Saad a captain in the Iraqi Air Force had his death sentence commuted to life in prison. Eventually, Saad was released in one of Saddam's amnesties. Having lost his wife and several years of his life, he fled Iraq hoping to forget the past and start afresh in the Netherlands. Being a decorated soldier in Iraq was not only an honor but a lifeline, Saddam had decreed that anyone with three medals would be recognized as a friend of the president which would mean leniency should the need ever arise. Follow for the next chapter.